and we will pray. Okay, okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC209, our course on holiness. Thank you for connecting to the class. Could we just pray together? And we'll get started. May I request somebody to pray with the class, please? Anyone could pray. All right. Who wants to pray? Please go ahead, Nangi. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you again this morning. We pray for that to you. Open our heart, Lord, and open our mind. And also empower us as she, Lord, as he teaches about your holiness, Lord, so that we may receive it. And what we learn, Lord, may be a fruit in our heart, Lord. And then we may be made more like you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. In your mighty name, Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so we're continuing here on this course on uh, um, holiness. And we have been talking about um, overcoming the world. So we were speaking on overcoming, overcoming the flesh, overcoming the world, and overcoming Satan, devil. So we started talking about overcoming the world uh, last week on Wednesday. We're going to continue forward with that, just go through some of the practical things that we could do. Um, because like we pointed out last week, uh, when we see in scripture that Paul had a co-worker, his name was Demas. And Paul writes two times or mentions his name two times. The first time he says, Demas is my fellow worker. Second time he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So you can imagine uh, uh, a man like Demas, who was a co-worker with the Apostle Paul. You know, uh, he has seen the ministry, he has heard about, I mean, he's heard Paul preach and teach. And, you know, he must have had some wonderful experiences journeying with Paul. Uh, as he went on the mi missions, missions, the missionary journeys, and seen all of this, and yet something somehow pulled him into the world. And Paul just says, having loved this present world. That means the pull of the world, the attractions of the world were so much that this man was willing to let go of his association with Paul, his involvement in the ministry, of his, you know, I, I don't know where he was in the faith, whether he continued in the faith or whether he abandoned his faith. I don't know. We don't know anything what, what happened to him after that. But it's very sad, you know, that Paul would write like that about a fellow worker somebody who was with him but then left and went because of the world because of the pull of the world so it's something all of us have to be very careful otherwise you know even see we only think about the devil being deceptive but what we must keep in mind is that the the things of the world can also deceive us. That's why when Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, he said, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things. So sometimes this, the world, the glamour of the world could become deceptive, could deceive us. So we were trying to, you know, understand it. And also, of course, everything has to be held in balance, meaning 
God is not saying, you know, don't engage with the world. Of course, we all have to engage with the world. We are living in it. Uh, we have responsibilities. Uh, you know, uh, we have to engage meaningfully with the world. We have to contribute uh, to whatever we are doing in the world and all of that. And all of that is good. And God gives us richly all things to enjoy. So God is not saying don't enjoy. But in the, all of that, we have to be careful that the world doesn't overpower us and control us. But we, we walk in victory over the world. So that's something we must learn to do. And hopefully these practical things will help us do that. So I'm going to go ahead and share the PDF that we were just looking at. So in chapter six, overcoming the world, uh, we said, you know, there are these are the areas of challenges, worldly influences, cares and pressures, and troubles and persecutions. And uh, we we were talking about this: the worldly influences and attractions that we face as believers, uh, the cares and the pressures of the world, the responsibilities of the world, and how they affect the word of God in us. Uh, you know, we've just talked about Paul mentioning in First Corinthians seven that. And when you're married, then you are you're responsible for things about your marriage and your home and so on. Um, and then, of course, we also face troubles and persecutions, hardships, difficulties, challenges that uh, could impact us. And we have to learn to overcome. So how do we live as overcomers? We started talking about some practical things. Number one, we said was to set our affections or our desires on things above. That means I am engaging with the world, I am interacting with the world, but my first and foremost desire is on things above. Right? That's ultimate. And out of that, I will, you know, we will do all these other things that 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 are responsibilities on the earth. Okay, we will do it. But our desire, first and foremost, is on God. So it's not that we don't enjoy things of the earth. Of course we enjoy. And God has given us uh, richly all things to enjoy. But we live in this place where we are very careful not to let our affections for the world become more stronger than our affection for God. Right? So we, we cover those things. And I, I, I'm not sure if somebody had a question here on this, I think there was a question from Abraham about uh, 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 managing some uh, 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 money and so on. So, uh, Abraham, is that something you want to ask now, or can I just continue? I, I remember there was some question we just left unanswered towards the end. Yes, sir. Uh, what I was. was mm. Yes, I I wanted to. Um, get some advice on how I could balance my finances and how I could save something um, because my position now and what we are doing now in Vietnam mm. uh, requires some financial support and mm. being the leader I cannot just sit down and watch uh, the need we have as a group of people and yet uh, saving some money apart. So that has been my challenge recently. Mm. So I wanted to know the balance. And it looks as if if I don't put the money into it, that problem will always be there. And then it even affects me than keeping the money. You know, example, like uh, maybe a ministry and then people are calling me, I cannot hear you. <laughs> the video is off. You know, so... On a ministry like that, and this thing happens, I mean, it bothers me a lot. Sometimes I'm distracted. Um, sometimes I have to leave the stage and go and fix something at the back end before I come back again. So I'm just trying to just um, do what I can. But that will mean that I have to put all I have into it to at least everything is, st is stable before I can at least start saving something. So is it a good thing to do or I should just um, use some portion of what I have to uh, to put into the ministry, then the problem will still be there. You know, because mm -hmm. the problem we are having now is we don't have the people that are committed to uh, the work. They just come to receive the word and go away. And we also have some people who are off 
online. So we are trying to balance the online and the offline together, meaning that our sound, our video, everything must be intact for those that are online. And then the venue too we have to is not a permanent venue that we can just go and fix everything and then we are done. We just go there for about three hours. Once we are done, we have to pack everything. And there is no one to pack. I'm the only one who has to pack everything. You know, which means that I have to buy good things and buy things that at least I can fix them within maybe one hour and then uh, obviously we can start our meeting because we don't even have somebody who is controlling the camera. We don't have somebody who is controlling the sound. So these are things that uh, requires me to put what I have in so that at least for, for a month or two, things can be stabilized for people to really hear what God is sharing. So in my case, do I continue to put what I have in or I should save something? Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Abraham, um, you know, first of all, thank God for the work you're doing and, you know, the, the heart you have uh, to give of whatever you have for the work that's, that, that God wants you to do. That's a very good thing. Uh, so continue with that. Now, uh, in in most cases, in most cases, uh, the person who is pioneering or leading the pioneering work uh, is the person you know who is making the sacrifice, who is investing, who is giving into that work, and that that's that's normal. Like it's it's something that we all have to do. That if, if, if you're going to pioneer a work, you're going to start something from scratch, uh, then, you know, you are the one who's going to be pouring in. But your goal should be to nurture leaders as soon as possible. Uh, two things. You need to communicate the vision and you need to raise up people who would help you. Right? So then what happens is uh, others can participate, others can share in the work that's happening. Right now, it's not easy, but that should be your goal. So one is communicate the vision of what's happening. Say, you know, guys, this is uh, this is a church. We are all to, in in it together. We are growing together. We are serving the Lord together. So I want to give you the opportunity to serve. You know, it'd be great if somebody can help with uh, setting up, with packing up after the service. And you try to nurture leaders, you know, give, delegate that. And then it will be great if somebody can, man, you know, manage the camera, if somebody can manage the sound. So that should be a goal. So in the beginning, yes, you would be doing all these things yourself. Um, the first couple of months would be like that. But once you have people coming in, your goal is to delegate and have people participate, at least volunteer their time and help you with various things. And then from there, you get people to get be part of things financially as well. You can just say, you know, look, I'm not pressuring anybody to give, but the fact is God's work requires money. You know, it costs money to rent the place. It costs money to buy the equipment. It costs money to, you know, whatever, whatever the expenses are. So you say, I'm going to keep an offering box here. And those who want to give, give. Those who don't want to, I mean, there's no compulsion. But I'm just keeping. So what happens is maybe the first two or three months, you know, yeah, you're putting your money. But then uh, uh, what ha uh, at some point you're going to transition. You're going to get the people are going to participate. So those of you who are watching online, uh, you can contribute online and, you know, you give them information how they can contribute online. You're not forcing them them to give money you're just inviting them you're giving them the opportunity and those whom god moves their heart will give and so once you know people are participating first is they're giving they're being volunteers they're giving off their time and energy and effort secondly they start being part of it financially then what happens then you can reduce you give whatever you you wish you can start saving your own personal money for your family's needs and etc so you you make that shift is that okay? Um, yes. Uh, another thing I just want to add is uh, now that uh, we are doing this, it requires so much time. In other words, I have to cancel most of my classes in order to uh, do the things of God. Like you said the last time, you had to 
quit your job, obviously to to be a full time minister. So in my case, is it advisable that I reduce some of my classes, even though I mean I've cancelled a couple of classes already, but I still don't get the the ample time I need to study the word of God and also to pray. Because for me, I believe that ministry is outflow of my relationship with God. So if my relationship with God is not intact, then I have no message for the people. So in order to be intact with God, I'll need more time because my way of studies require more time. I mean, I cannot just study the Bible for one hour or two hours. I need to be very relaxed and to have some, knowing that I don't have anything to do today. And then I can study. But if I study under pressure, I don't re really receive anything. And that will require that I cancel most of my classes. What is the advice towards that too? Mm. Now, when you say classes, do you mean Bible college classes or you mean something else? Is it uh, no, no. I mean the, the teaching hours I have in, 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 in Vietnam. I teach English in Vietnam. Too. Oh, okay. So what you're doing as a job? Yes, 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 those classes you're up into. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it all depends on, you know, uh, how you, like, one is, you have to manage your time. That's one thing. The other thing is, you also have to manage your finances, because obviously you need money to live there in Vietnam. And if you do, do fewer classes, the numbers, I think your income might also go down. Uh, um, yeah, right. So you, you would be the best person to decide on you know, how to manage that. So if you are able to manage yourself on a smaller income, because you're going to be doing fewer classes, um, and that gives you a little bit more time, and that is fine. But what I would say is you do make the transition, you know, at the right time, right? Don't just go and suddenly say, okay, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm reducing my teaching by 50%, my income drops by 50%. Um, you don't do that because it could hit you hard. Instead, you know, like we said, as the work is growing, that means you're getting more people to help volunteer, you're getting people to contribute, be part of it financially, then you start reducing your classes because you, you have income coming to take care of the ministry expenses. So you, you don't have to put that money in, etc. right? So what I'm saying is, uh, you have to look at the big picture. Uh, you have to see, um, uh, you know, sometimes you have to work hard. You know, sometimes it's okay for a season that you really put an extra effort just to go through that season. And it's not going to last forever. It may be three, four months. You're working extra hard. And you go through that season, then you come out in a better place. That's okay. Uh, so it, it all depends. Uh, you know, on, on how you, you look at the big picture, look at your time, look at your money, look at where the ministry is, and then you, you know, you, 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 you gradually make the transitions or changes so that things are balanced. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Thank uh, you so much. All right. All right. Sorry. I hope the others, uh, you know, it's like a personal call we are having and everybody else is listening. <laughs> but I hope it's useful for others. Sorry. Uh, it took yeah, some time. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So where were we? We were Christopher, you have a question? Go ahead. Oh uh, yes, Pastor. So uh, this is a question with regards to cares and, and pressures that um, that come from the world. And uh, this would be directly related to the um, care the care um, that that needs to be provided to uh, the family, our you know the immediate family. So um, I mean, there could be a couple of scenarios where there is a need for you know a more um, a you know a larger presence of um, the person who who wants to serve God, uh, but is caught between you know serving God in some in a in a in a larger capacity, and there are. There are cares that are that need to be provided to, you know, to the to, to mm. our family members, and um, um, I mean, this could be in you know at you know at in different stages of uh, you know of one's life. It could be in an earlier stage, you know, where uh, uh, you know the children are are, are younger younger, 
and uh, you know, I, I, I mean, there have been some cases um, because I've heard you know where uh, uh, pastors or people who have who want to serve God uh, have in a sense um, neglected the family, and uh, uh, you know they have spent that time to you know to to you know to open churches and you know preach the word. So I just wanted to understand um, uh, you know where there is this need to keep God first uh, but there are there are also pressures that, that come from being uh, uh, you know a married person um, how that sort of you know um, kind of um, balances uh, each other and um, where uh, even at a later stage in, in you know in the uh, uh, you know when when family has has uh, you know, has has become. I mean, children have got older, but there is still a need to you know to to have that presence. Um, you know, uh, to to provide guidance, provide uh, uh, you know uh, that that level of uh, uh, you know imparting of uh, whatever is required. Uh, you know, for for children or for you know for the spouse. And that could that could then you know not be uh, not really active could come in the way of of serving God. So you just wanted to uh, you know get your view on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a very important question. Um, I can share with you you know my personal perspective and how I have tried to live my life. There may be people who agree with me. There may be people who disagree. But what I've tried to do is I've tried to. See, okay, let me say, from a biblical perspective, I feel the Bible tells us very clearly to be responsible for our families, right? Because you find this, you know, in First Timothy chapter 3, uh, Paul the Apostle is talking about spiritual leaders. Basically, he's talking about bishops and deacons. That means those who are uh, spiritually leading the church and those who are um, uh, serving the church administratively, like a deacon type. And in both cases, for both roles in the church, one of the requirement is they should take care of their own family. They should take care of their wife and children, both. And this is in First Timothy chapter 3. Same thing in Titus. So these are pastoral episodes. So Paul has nurtured Timothy, he has nurtured Titus, both are these young men and they're in leadership. And to both of them, in both Timothy and Titus, as part of the requirement for spiritual leadership, Paul says they should take care of their family. So that's what my conviction is. My conviction is, yes, we are called to do ministry. But we should not neglect family while saying, I'm going to do ministry. So, but everything you have said, Christopher, is so true, is so true. And sometimes very sad, you know, um, um, to see ministers of God uh, who end up neglecting their family in the name of doing ministry or saying, I'm loving God. But here's something that really helps, helped me that, and this is something I tell myself, that ministry to my family, that is my wife and my children, is ministry. It's ministering to God. It's fulfilling my calling. So when I spend time with my wife or when I spend time with my children, uh, I don't see it as taking away from ministry. I see it, it is my ministry. I am doing something as important as preaching the word and teaching the word. If all I'm doing is just spending time with my wife or all I'm doing is spending time with my children, I'm doing something equally important, probably maybe more important because the Bible is telling us, you know, husband, love your wife. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Right. So that's, that's, that's the way I feel. Um, uh, I, I, I see it and I think it's, Biblical, it's, it's just applying the Bible. So here's what I did in my life. You know, when the, when our children, Amy and I, we have two kids, Joshua and Ruth, 
and um, uh, when they were growing up, that means when they were during their school years from grade, you know, till up to grade 12, um, I used to keep time during the week f just for my children. Uh, and that time I would not accept for anything else. So basically this was every Saturday morning and during the week, um, I, I would be involved with my children. That means, you know, okay, every when I come home in the evenings, you know, make sure what, what's going on with their studies, you know, I'm trying to understand what's going on, just talking to them, praying with them, um, and uh, getting involved with their lives, you know, being interested in what interests them. So taking time to do that. I felt that is part of my ministry, right? It's, it's serving God. It's doing what's pleasing to God. And then every week, Saturday mornings would be time for them. So I would play for, play soccer with Josh, and then we would go and uh, I would take them for music class. We would have brunch outside. It was like a special time, and then we would uh, we would uh, uh, I take them to music class. So they would you know they would do their music class and bring them home. So I had so if people came and said you know can you come and preach at a conference on Saturday morning? I said sorry no I've got something important. Time is already booked. And what's important? That's spending time with children. You know, so that's how you know it was while they were growing up. Now another thing that uh, Amy and I did. Now Amy, she decided. Now she she's a doctor, but she decided to stay home while the kids were growing up. So that was a choice she made, right? So only after they, I think, um, I don't know, seventh grade or something, that she went back to practicing. So uh, so she took. Um, I think it was a 12 year gap. Now it's now that's a big gap for somebody in the medical profession, but she chose to do that, uh, to be with the children while they're growing up. And then after that, so now she's you know, for many years, she's back in the, in the working in the hospital. But so these are choices we made as a family uh, where we said, we are going to do this. We're going to minister to our own family because that is serving God, ministering to God. And there was no guilt, nothing about it. it we felt it's valuable, it's honorable. And then, uh, yeah, of course, both kids turned 18. They left for college. They're in both in the US, but we still engage with them. So, uh, of course, they're adults. We speak to them as adults now, but uh, we are still interested in what interests them. Right, so we're involved in their lives. It's not like, uh, okay, work is over, kids are gone. You no, know, we are still engaged in you know helping. So uh, both are transitioning into the workplace now. Uh, so we are involved in helping them through the process. Uh, you know, just uh, you know, Ruth has done a biology and she wants to get into genetics, so we're still involved. You know, so I kind of example. I did mock interviews with her, uh, you know, online, asking her questions and all that. And then uh, uh, now she's getting ready for interviews uh, with some science labs and all that. And she she'll work for two years and then go back into doing a master's. Uh, Joshua's into technologies, into software engineering so I kind of work with him that's that's my background so I can you know relate to him more and guide, give him guidance and so he's again transitioning into the workplace so I help him with the interview process the job search process um, so we you know uh, I feel the time we spend of course it's it's at a different level right we're not controlling their lives you're only aiding them or we are kind of uh, coming alongside them in this journey because they're adults now. Um, but it is ministering to family. It is honoring God. Right? And, you know, I'm looking forward to the time, I believe in God that one day, you know, together we can serve God, you know, in with different nations. And all of that will come in its time. But now they're going through their, you know, education, job transition process, all that. So, uh, to answer your question, this, Christopher, I feel that uh, we shouldn't look at it as a burden, but we, sh you know, our our time that we take to minister to our family, we should look at it as an honor. We should look at it as something God has privileged us to do. Uh, it's not taking away from quote unquote ministry. This is ministry. This is honoring God. This is glorifying God, and this is something God has, you know, called us to do. In as much as he may have called us to preach the Bible, 
or you know minister to the people this is also a calling which we have to fulfill and so uh, of course everything has to be done it you know kept in its place it's not going to consume us it's going to not going to take us away from fulfilling the other side of message which is ministering to the people or the pastoring or or our time with god everything is held in balance and everything is as unto the lord uh, that's how i would um, you know respond to that is that okay did i answer your question okay all right so good let's uh, move forward with um, what we were talking about all right so uh number two is um you know we as part of how we overcome the influences in the world so one we said you know we uh, keep our affections on things above while we are doing the things we're supposed to do our affections are on things above secondly we uh, we stay sanctified by the word and the spirit and that means uh, we are very careful that the word of god keeps us clean right so uh, remember what jesus said in john 15 he said you're clean because of the word i've spoken to you right so now the point is this right there will be things in the world that try to contaminate us. How do they try to contaminate us? Sometimes it could be by trying to affect our thinking or the way we look at things uh, or by affecting our affections and desires, pulling on our desires and so on. So the things of this world. And that is where the word of God keeps us clean, right? depending on the Holy Spirit, keeps us clean. Like I said, you know, last class, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, it, this, this affects every, everything. So, it, you know, if, if there's a pull, example, and there's a pull. So example, you think about a salesperson, okay? Uh, in whatever industry, you know, he's, he's doing sales. And, um, and of course, you know, uh, usually in many industries uh, for salespeople, their salary is, you know, they have a fixed amount and then they have a, what is called as a commission. That means, okay, if you make so much sales for the company, you will get that variable amount, right? So there's a fixed amount, there's a variable amount. This is typical uh, for business people in business development. So basically it's like an incentive. Now you do more sales, you get more uh, income, right? Now, suppose the salesperson, he goes to sell his product, whatever he's selling, he goes to somebody and then they try to strike a deal with him. They say, look, we will give you this order, but, uh, you know, we need a kickback. You know, we need, uh, you know, we need a certain amount to give to us off the books, right? So they're trying to strike a deal. So, we, you know, for him, for the salesperson, it looks very attractive because he can tell his company, I have closed so much in sales. And of course, his, his income is going to increase. But these people are, want a kickback. They say, look, if we give you this order, you've got to give us so much money off the books. Uh, no, it's unaccounted for. Now, so he's got to make a decision, right? What should I do? So look, there's the pull of the world. There's the affection of the world. There's the attraction of the world. There's something that's being presented to him by the world. Of course, if he's in the word of God, the word of God teaches us, you know, that wealth gained through dishonesty, that will make itself wings and fly away. It's going to go. It's not going to bless you. So I'm just giving one example. But like this, there are many other scriptures that, that teach us to walk in integrity. And so he says, look, I'm not going to do it, right? So he's keeping himself clean because of the word of God or by the word of God in that situation where, of course, we all want to make money. We all want to be successful, but we want to do it the right way, right? And so like this, there could be so many examples where uh, 
there is the pull of the world, but you have to be in the Word of God, and the Word of God helps us stay clean while the, the world will throw its, its attractions, its options before us, right? You stay clean, stay holy, stay pure. Number three, when we are engaging with the world, you know, what we have is, we have faith in God and we have a renewed mind. So this is something very important for us, for us to overcome the world. Our faith in God and a renewed mind, right? That means we choose to operate out of a place of faith in God and a renewed mind as we deal with the things of the world. And so we think differently. We look at the pressures or the challenges through faith in God or the renewed mind rather than just the natural mind, right? So when you face problems, you, you know, you use your faith in God, you use your renewed mind to overcome the winds and the waves, the mountains, the hindrances, or closed doors. And, and so that makes a big difference. That means the world is not dictating things to us. We conquer the world. We are dominating the world through faith in God. And as we live out of a renewed mind, yeah. So there can be just numerous challenges, whether you face financially or whether you face it in your job, in your work life or other areas. And you face every challenge, you face everything through faith in God and with a renewed mind. And that is very important for us to live victorious over the world. Okay, and one last thing is this. Another important thing for us as believers is that we must learn to be spiritually minded and earthly wise. So sometimes, you know, we think that, well, if I want to live holy, if I want to live pleasing to God, uh, I should not be smart in the things of the earth. No, you should be smart. We should be spiritually minded, but also be earthly wise, because look, as long as we are on the earth, we have to engage with the world. That means, you know, there are a lot of things we have to do uh, that, that, that has to fit into um, the systems around us, meaning, you know, there is a civil or a government environment in which we live, and the government has the rules and laws and provisions. There is a business world uh, or, you know, all these different areas where have, they have their own systems of working, and we need to understand. We, we need to be wise about how we engage with the things of the world and use it to our advantage, use it to uh, further the purposes of the kingdom of God. And so that's being earthly wise, right? So there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong in understanding or learning how these systems work and leveraging it to your advantage, right? So for example, Jesus said, uh, and I'm sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. Yeah, things are going to be harsh. You know, imagine sheep in the midst of wolves. How are sheep going to survive? You know, wolves are going to, you know, tear them apart. How are sheep going to survive? Well, he said, you've got to be wise like serpents. So use the wisdom of God. Be wise. You know, be harmless. That means we are not going to fight. We are not going to, you know, attack or, you know, be, you know, use, uh, uh, use uh, evil, but we are going to walk with wisdom, right? So we are sheep in the midst of wolves. We must walk with wisdom. So, for example, you know, uh, let's say when it comes to money, uh, there's nothing wrong in 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 being a wise, uh, good steward of your money. And I shouldn't say nothing wrong. It is a necessity, right? We are in this world. Yes, we are spiritual people, we want to live holy, but you need to be wise in the way you use your money and how you manage money, how you save and how you prepare for the future and what you do. Right? Same thing with our church, church finances. So uh, when it comes to the ministry, and next year I will, talk, I will be talking to you about um, church ministry and administration to get into all the things that happen uh, behind the scenes. You, you, you don't see all this, but there's a lot of administrative things that happen on the ministry side. And part of that is the accounting, right? So, um, uh, uh, so you, even when it comes to ministry, financial management, you need to be 
good. You need to be strong. You need to be wise about those things. Uh, and uh, uh, whether for your own personal life or when it, or it comes to ministry, we need to be earthly wise. Otherwise, what happens is we get into trouble. We get into a lot of difficulty, not because we're not holy people, not because we're not good people, but we are not being earthly wise. And then, you know, it really sets us back. Sometimes it pulls us down. Sometimes it hinders us from being effective for the kingdom of God. So to close here, you know, how can we live victoriously with the world? I want you to think about these four things. One, keep your affections on the things of God. Guard your affections. Keep it in the right place. Second, keep yourself clean. Stay sanctified by the word and the spirit, depending on the Holy Spirit. Depending on the word of God, keep yourself clean. Uh, there is contamination all around us. We can't avoid it, but we can keep it, keep the contaminants from getting into us by staying clean with the word of God and the spirit of God. Thirdly, we live by faith and with a renewed mind. So there will be challenges, there will be all kinds of difficulties, but we overcome them by faith in God and with a renewed mind. And number four, we must be spiritually minded, keep our things, our mind on the things of God, but we must also be earthly wise. Don't be afraid of, you know, learning how these systems work and being smart about it and uh, using it or leveraging it for your advantage or for the advantage of the purpose of the kingdom of God. Not, I'm not saying be dishonest. No, we're not being dishonest, but with integrity, leverage these things for your advantage or for the advantage of the kingdom of God. Okay, so let me take any questions here as far as we're talking about overcoming the world, now dealing with things in the world. So let me see if there are any questions here. Okay, any practical questions here when we are talking about dealing with things of the world, overcoming the world, how to live victorious over the world? Any practical questions? Okay, yeah, so an Adivya's question is, is it through the renewing of our minds that the word of God sanctifies us? Yes, right, so that's, that's the way how the word of God works. That's one of the ways, right? So that means you renew your mind and the Bible, you know, Paul writes, we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. So that's one of the ways. Another way, other ways are like, you know, the word of God as we receive it, it sets us free. The word of God instructs us on how to live right. Uh, the word of God corrects us. You know, it convicts us and says, look, this is, you know, what you should be doing, not that. So the word of God has many effects, but it impacts us. And that's how, you know, we are sanctified, kept clean. Okay. All right. I see Christopher has raised his hand and who else? And Anita. Anita, go ahead. Anita, go ahead. Pastor, I had a question in respect to... Uh new age uh, teaching right now and uh, like a new age teaching is getting into the schools also hmm. right now so like uh, and uh, like for example if it is the uh, like for in the in, in case of vaccination hmm. where now people are aware that the vaccination it is optional like uh, when it was introduced it was introduced as compulsory Mm. Like uh, these all things are going to come up. Like in this uh, regards, how can we live victorious? Mm. Um, so you're asking, uh, so uh, you're asking specifically about vaccination or in general about the new age ideas? I'm sorry. Uh, the actually what happened is like when vaccination came pasta it was mm. like uh, told compulsory 
like uh, whereas people now are fighting against it and it is the it is there in the government they have the paper legal papers where they can show and can say that it is optional it is not mm. mandatory so like wherever like new age teaching is now they want to enforce in the schools also so it will be enforced like uh, like how the vaccination initially when came everybody thought it was mandatory like that and uh, and the, like if you see uh, in the gender equality or whatever they are coming up with and uh, it is a new age schools are coming up and these all things are getting uh, in their studies in the, as a syllabus it's getting introduced like in all of this how can we uh, leave victorious and how we have to like uh, make our children aware or how do we have to ch- or uh, select the schools and because everywhere we are going to face this in these mm. days mm. 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 okay um all right let me um again, okay i'll turn on to this um so about vaccinations I, i know that's a kind of a medical issue uh yeah the pandemic happened and uh, vaccinations came on subsequently so you know the fact is uh, in, in almost all of the developing worlds now uh, vaccinations has been around for many years right so when a baby is born at least in most of the developing world kids are vaccinated uh, they are given you know mmr vaccine measles mumps measles mumps and rubella vaccination and and other vaccine which is which is a normal thing in the developing world so i don't see anything wrong with that kids are vaccinated against certain things from the time they are born uh, it's for their protection and that's something that's been there for you know for a long time and people are still practicing it so uh, when the pandemic came and um, they of course introduced the vaccinations against the uh, for preventive measures so see a vaccination is not a cure it's only a prevent an attempt at preven- prevention to whatever degree that's possible depending on the problem so if you ask me personally i'm not against vaccinations uh i got myself vaccinated uh, and i i don't think it's a sin i don't think god's angry with us <laughs> it's just normal you know uh, uh in the us people get flu shots vaccines they do it every year it's just they they, they do it of course in india nobody talks about flu shots i mean maybe some hospitals they have but you know so different parts of the world that 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 so but basically medicine is not against god medicine is a way to help us and these same people who are against vaccinations also go to the hospital for other things you know and the bigger things actually so they are self contradictory you know these people who are against vaccinations they will go and get a bypass hey a bypass is much bigger than a vaccination yeah, so why are you if you're standing against vaccination why are you even going to the hospital to take medicines so it's actually the whole argument is pretty foolish self contradictory but i won't get into it but the point is if you ask me my my point of view medicine is there to help us god has given us knowledge we use knowledge in a way to benefit our own life on earth okay that's about vaccinations about new age teaching again you see you know these things have been there for a while, from a long time meaning right from our days like 30 years ago 40 years ago you know our 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 biology books had stuff on evolution and uh, uh, and uh, you know things have only progressed like that and so even today there may be other ideas or then you know in government schools in india they're trying to bring in hindu philosophy hindu teaching so all these things are there in different parts of the world uh, people you know are dealing with different things and it's been there for for a long time just that new things or maybe very the variations keep coming in so how do we combat that well the most important thing is that as christian parents uh, that we do our part to provide uh, the understanding for our children and again it, it, you know our children are growing up so the way they understand the way they learn will change and we have to uh, uh provide that input into their lives as they're growing up so as kids we can tell them you know this is what this is what the bible says we can tell them bible stories but then 
in their teenagers, they're not going to listen to Bible stories. They're going to ask questions. They want us to explain. So we can't just say, just believe. No, they want to know why you believe. Why is something so? So as parents, we have to explain. We can't just say, just believe it because pastor told it. That doesn't work, you know, when they're in the teenage years. In the teenagers, they are thinking. They like to think independently. And so we need to support that process. We not discourage independent thinking process. Encourage that. That's how they become adults. Uh, don't think it's a violation of who, who God is. No. And the ability to think independently and ask questions is a good thing. But we need to be able to explain. We need to show them why. You know, they, and then eventually they become adults where they, uh, they want to reason. They want to you know, make decisions. And we encourage them through the process. So just to answer your question very quickly, uh, the challenges in schools have, have been there for many decades now. It's just packaged in different ways. Different things are being packaged to children in different ways through the years. It's always been the governments in different parts of the world are trying to package different things. So if you think about Russia, you think about China, you know, everywhere in different parts of the world, different things are being put forward to children. And um, what we can do as parents is work with them, you know, and, and at their level, you know, as they keep growing up, the way they interact, the way they understand, the way they ask questions keeps changing. And we have to be able to work with them at their level. Okay. This is in a very brief answer, uh, Anita. I know Jean, is, <laughs> marriage and family is also a good place to ask. I hope I answered your question, Anita. I, uh... Yes, sir. thank you, Pastor. Thank okay. you so much. All right, I think there are two more hands here. Uh, let's see now. We have Christopher and was somebody else raised a hand? I don't know. Okay, Chris, we have a quick question, or otherwise we could pick it up next on Wednesday. Oh no, I think I think we need to pick it up on Wednesday, uh, Pastor. I mean, my question is probably requires more time. <laughs> mm. Okay, so, yeah. let's do that. Um, we will pick it up on Wednesday. Please, and um, please, you know, just remind and ask your question at the beginning of the class, and we'll do it. Okay. So we've covered on overcoming the world, the influences, the challenges of the world. And as believers, you know, we need, we need to live victorious over the world. Um, like Anita was pointing out, things are getting complicated. Things are getting even more, how to say, vicious and difficult and complex. Uh, but God's wisdom is there. And as individuals, as church communities, you know, we can overcome. Yeah. Okay, let's close close in prayer and we will dismiss. Um, who would like to pray, please? Somebody could pray and dismiss us. Okay. Who wants to pray? Can I pray, Pastor? Go ahead, please. Be nice. Yeah. So let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time, Father God, of learning, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for your word that you help us to, that you give us, Father God, to sanctify ourselves. Thank you for the spirit, Father God, that you help us to direct us, Father God. Yes, Father God, in this complicated world, Father God, help us to grow and grow more in you, Father God, so that the time will come when we will face the, face the challenges and the things, Father God, we will be the victorious, we will be the conqueror, Father God. We pray that, Lord Jesus, each one of us, Lord Jesus, we will grow in you, Father God, with a one accord and one mind, Father God. And as we are pursuing these classes, Father God, help us to think, help us to understand the things, Father God, in a more deeper way, Father God, so that it will not, it will not go vain, Father God, but it will be always established in our heart, in our family, in our societies, Father God. Thank you, Father God. We submit everyone into your mighty hand, Jesus. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Hey. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you again. Um, so, no class tomorrow. I'll see you on Wednesday. Okay. God Thank bless. You, God. bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Rupa, happy birthday. I think your birthday was yesterday or day before. I'm not sure. Sir, my birthday? Mm -mm. Was it your birthday? No, sir. February 28th. 
Thank 28. you. 28. Okay, okay. I, somebody, I saw one name. It comes up in our management system. It must be somebody else. Okay. Maybe, yeah. Yes. Thank God you. God bless. Bye, everyone. See you all.